My name is Sasha Bates. I'm a psychotherapist and I lost my husband, Bill, and I wrote a book about losing him called Languages of Loss. Welcome to another episode of The Silent Why. I'm Claire Sands. I'm Chris Sands, and this is a podcast with a mission to find 101 different types of loss. Chatting to those who've experienced them firsthand to see if it's possible to find hope, maybe even joy in all types. And in this episode, we chat to Sasha Bates, a writer and psychotherapist from London, about the losses she's been through, the death of her dad, childlessness, and then more recently, the sudden death of Bill Cashmore, actor, director, playwright, but perhaps more importantly, her husband and best friend. Within just over 24 hours, he went from being completely fine to, oh, he needs heart surgery, oh, he's had a stroke, he's effectively dead. So it was just too much for my brain to process. Having experienced the bond that is built in a marriage when you go through childlessness, we can imagine how awful it must have been for Sasha to find her family of two was suddenly a one again. Something Sasha thought would leave her with nobody to lean on but it didn't turn out exactly as she imagined. Before I knew it, people were like pouring in and I kind of realised, no, people do step up and people do love me and they do love Bill and, you know, even the ones that maybe were more his friends than mine, they knew that they could honour him by looking after me and that was really, really powerful. Sasha's journey is an example of how even in the most heartbreaking, unexpected death, there is good to be found in the grief. I can't really explain it other than it's one of those things that you have to go through to realise that even when you experience your worst nightmare, there are gains to be found. There are positives to come out of it. We started off this conversation with Sasha explaining how she got from the director's chair to a director's sofa, a career in TV, to working in psychotherapy. I was in television for 18 years, um, from my early 20s onwards, and I was sort of approaching 40 and just completely sick of the television industry, the hours and the stress and the micromanagement and um, just a lot of change from when I began. And I, I wanted a way out and didn't really know what else to do, but I had had a lot of therapy myself in my um 20s and had found it completely transformational and I think I what, what I kind of realized slightly with hindsight is that the things that sent me into television which were being really curious about people about how we come to be who we are what makes us tick how relationships work were actually also the things that sort of propelled me into psychotherapy um because you you look for slightly different motivations but you're kind of looking at uh, you're looking for answers to the sort of the bigger questions i think in both industries initially i thought well i'll i'll go and do a foundation course in in psychotherapy really just as a way to kind of get get myself some breathing space out of the television industry and think about what I wanted to do but almost as soon as I began I kind of thought oh no actually this is this is it this is the thing I want to do and before I knew it six years had gone and somehow I seemed to have qualified as a therapist and thought oh well I I better do the job now (laughs) so yeah it's not it feels like a huge leap but actually like I say with hindsight I don't think it's that dissimilar in in many ways. What was what was your experience of grief and loss at that point then when you switched had you had much of that in your life? No not really I'd lost my grandmother well both grandmothers but and both grandfathers but only one grandmother that I really knew well enough to have impacted me. I found it very upsetting but you know grandparents there's always that one remove at that stage I think I had done two rounds of IVF so I hadn't so I'd experienced that loss of of realizing that it wasn't going to be as easy as I thought so I'd had a few years of that kind of loss but I hadn't yet got to the point of realizing actually this is not going to happen for me so so I think when I started psychotherapy I know I probably hadn't really known a huge amount of loss uh, from my own experience. Rewind the clock to the early 2000s. So this was a man that you described as your safe ship of stability. So so yeah. in those early days, how did you meet him and, and what what was the romance like, the, the relationship building, etc.? Yeah, well, we actually met on holiday. We'd both gone alone on a holiday to Greece, which is one of these sort of activity holidays. And we met, I think, on the first day. Um, We just kind of hit it off. We just got on really well. We felt like we'd known each other for ages. And it felt 
a bit like, oh, there you are. It was almost like I'd always known him. It didn't ever feel like I hadn't known him. It was, you know, within a couple of days, it felt like we'd known each other forever. Yeah, so we there wasn't really much of a romance. Like I say, it was just kind of like, oh, right, okay, this is clearly what, what we're doing. Never really questioned it, never really had any doubts. I'd bought a, I'd bought a new house the, the same week I went on holiday. Um and when I got back and sort of showed it to Bill, which was like, you know, two weeks after we'd met, he sort of went, oh, maybe I should, you know, come and live here with you. And six weeks later, he would bought half the house and it, it just never felt difficult. It just never felt like a decision. It just felt like, you know, this is clearly what's meant to happen. Um, so, yeah, we were very, very compatible. We thought the same. We liked doing the same things. Uh, we just got on incredibly well uh, you mentioned like infertility you had some IVF rounds and yeah. what, what did that journey look like how did you both cope with that yeah well we never I mean it was never explained we never got to the bottom of why we why we couldn't get pregnant I think we just assumed when we met that uh that we would have kids um and then it kind of wasn't happening and um so we went and you know decided to get get on with trying IVF um the first round we thought that'll work the second one kind of thought oh, well the first one often doesn't work the second one will and then I think after the second one we did start to think oh right okay this could be a problem <laughs> um so I think um for for us with each six we did five attempts and I think with each one we were getting more and more sort of less invested with each one we were, were more getting more kind of like okay this really might not happen so yeah I mean it was it was really hard we did a lot of crying and soul searching and and feeling really sad and just had to use each other to kind of bolster us through really and I mean luckily we'd always done a lot of traveling um we were both really happy in our jobs and we we just kind of said okay let's just make the most of having each other you know there's other ways to live it's not the way we thought we were going to live but 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 it can it can be good so there was a lot of sadness but also a lot of okay fine this is the lot this is the hand we've been dealt let's um just get on with it but yeah no obviously as you know it never goes away the, the sadness never goes away but again it never really shook us as a, as a couple we just thought okay well this kind of means we've thrown together you even even more so it was hard it was hard your story in that regard is, is very similar to Claire's and myself we recognize a lot of where we've come from uh, in what you've written and what we've heard you speaking about uh, elsewhere when you make that decision with the two of you, because you had just such the lovely relationship that you did and you make the decision, OK, it's going to be us two. Did everything then sort of in the immediate months, years after that, did it work out thinking, wow, this is really exciting. We've got loads of time, resources, money, we can holiday. You know, was it what you wanted it to be or did you still find, OK, this this is mostly great, but there are still challenges to overcome? Well, the sadness never went away. Um, but yes, I think we did just um, say, right, well, given the, the, the this is where we are, let's make the most of it. Let's say, you know, we couldn't, you know, we did a lot of times say, well, we couldn't be doing this if we had kids. So I think there's a lot of um, compensating and saying, right, let's go to the theatre, let's go on the holidays, let's, you know, just really live life to the full other than that there weren't really that many other problems like I say we both enjoyed our jobs we were kind of financially okay we found lots of things that we liked doing so no that was that was the only real obstacle we had well until my dad died I mean that was obviously another big big loss and that I suppose that was the first really difficult thing that happened to us that was in 2013 um Bill had lost his own dad when he was very, well, very young. He was an adult. He was, I think, 23 or something. I think he was just finishing university. And he'd got on really well with my dad. So I think it hit him almost as hard as me, really. I think that was the hardest thing that we, we had to deal with as a couple beyond the childlessness. Um, other than that, it was pretty good, really. We, <laughs> we didn't really have, um, you know, we were both in good health. We were both fit and healthy and sort of gym bunnies and Bill ran marathons and you know didn't eat meat didn't smoke barely drank so there was no reason to think that we wouldn't 
you know sail off into the sunset for for you know a few more decades and do all the all the things that we wanted to do which is mainly traveling and and, and art <laughs> so um like a few of our other guests that have been on not many um some people can say that they've survived their worst nightmare and i know that's words that you've used um so why don't you tell us what that worst nightmare looked like for you yeah, well, I mean, like I say, Bill was incredibly healthy and fit and um, we had no reason to believe that was ever going to change, or at least not in the immediate future. And one day, one Sunday, uh, we were preparing to go out for lunch with some friends and he suddenly, literally, like cliche, clutched his chest and kind of went pale and it wasn't a heart attack. I mean, we discovered later it was what's called an aortic dissection where the aorta splits and the, the blood kind of goes everywhere. But the thing with aortic dissection is that it can mimic a lot of other things. So whilst he was standing there clearly feeling huge pain and confusion, I was there going, are you having a heart attack? Are you having a stroke? What's going on? Have you slipped a disc? You know, I literally didn't know because because of the, the blood's released from the aorta, it goes all over the place. So he had like a pain in his groin and then he had a pain in his stomach and then he had a pain in his neck. And it was so confusing. It was like none of these symptoms add up to anything I'd ever heard of. So didn't even know whether to kind of call an ambulance, drive, drive him to the hospital myself. Anyway, long story short, the, the doctor that we saw when we got to the hospital also didn't know what it was because it's quite a rare thing. And because the symptoms are very, very random. So we faffed around a lot. Um, and it was only when Bill's leg went out from under him, his his whole left side became a bit, came paralyzed that, and he collapsed that they started to take it seriously. Anyway, again, it was a, a lot of stuff happening. An MRI showed that it was this aortic dissection, the the answer was to have heart surgery, which he had. Um, they told me it had gone well. They said I could go back the next day and they'd wake him up. Um, I went back the next day and they said, we can't wake him up. He's had a stroke over the course of the day. That stroke, which was caused by a blood clot in his neck, got worse and worse. And by that evening, by the Monday evening, they said, there's nothing more we can do. Um, he's not going to survive. So within just over 24 hours, he went from being completely fine that, uh, oh, he needs heart surgery. Oh, he's had a stroke. He's effectively dead. So it was just too much for my brain to process, really. And it, then he was then three days in a coma, kind of waiting to die for various complicated medical reasons. So there was never any hope he would recover. But he wasn't um officially dead at that, at that point so it was a horrific five days and when I look back now I think I spent most of it just in sort of shock and it took a long time I think for for reality to catch up. How much in those three days of just utter nightmare of just waiting for notification that the end had come for Bill mm -hmm. in those three days how much were you balancing the sort of the expert um, and how to start grieving and actually the human experiencing, you know, the the loss that was coming of, of your soulmate? Yeah, there was absolutely no, no expert in evidence <laughs> for, for quite a, quite a long time. It was just kind of being in the moment really, but also um, and sort of dealing with, with, being there in this horrific experience, but also slightly dissociating and slightly floating above the moment and kind of watching myself go through the motions. But no, I think it took quite a while for my brain to sort of come back online and to to be able to sort of think think like a therapist. And even then it was only, you know, in patches. The grief was so overwhelming that I wasn't really thinking clearly, even as a person, mm. <laughs> let alone as a as a therapist. And I think that's what can can happen in well in traumatic grief. I mean, you know, when it is a it is a shock, but and that sort of is the point of shock in a way. It can cushion you because it's too much to get your head around in in one go. And I was really calm throughout. I mean, not, there were moments when I would, you know completely lose it but most of the time even when they told me there's nothing more we can do there was a sort of just a sort of calmness and a sort of a disbelief and people kept saying oh you know you're doing really well and kind of 
I don't know. My, I think my response is to go into sort of shut down. I think, you know, we all have our sort of trauma responses. And mine is, I think, to, to shut down rather than go large. <laughs> so, yes, I think, you know, I probably did look like I was coping quite well, but it, it was just kind of absolute disbelief, really. Yeah. Does it sort of suspend all emotions? Because I would normally ask, like, what was the overriding emotion? But it sounds like it just sort of suspends them all for a while. Yes, I think I think suspending them is is a good way of putting it. Yeah, there was a sort of a numbness, um, just a kind of right one foot in front of the other, and I just don't think I. I mean, I took it on, took it on board in a literal sense. I got what they were saying, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think there was emotions involved. But apart from, like I say, you know, every so often, you know, every few hours, it would suddenly hit home, and I would, you know, wet wail and kind of collapse but I think yeah it was I think it's too much you I think you just it's almost like a drip feeding a little bit of reality at a time and then you switch back into the into the numbness how did that change or evolve in the weeks and the months ahead and the balance of that numbness and then the and then the back to the sort of the wailing and the pain <laughs> Yeah, it was very random. Um, and that was, I think, my overriding impression of those early weeks and, and months of just not feeling in control of my own um, responses to anything, really. Um, I think I say in, in, in the book that it felt, felt like there was some sadistic controller sitting there with a remote that kind of had a sort of cry now button or a be numb now or just get on with it now button um I just felt like I was in an out of control sort of white water raft kind of thing that I just kind of was just clinging on but yeah I think in the in the early months there was quite a lot of dipping in in and out because the dif- disbelief lasts a long time but then when it lifts and you get more moments of reality um it's pretty painful um and then it shuts down again and yeah is there a moment when you look back when you think that was the worst point uh no I think there were several Mm. several really low points um you probably better not (laughs) list them or I might (laughs) you might not get the rational me back again because even now there's some there were some bits where if I if I think about them too deeply I know it will set set me Mm. off uh, uh, again so there were several bad bits, really. Was that sort of, were they things that were um, out of your control or were they triggered by specific things? Was it that still that sadistic kind of remote control going on? Yeah, I think I can see what the triggers were. The, the things around like the moment when he was taken away for, to, for the organ donation. And similarly, many, many months later, probably almost a year later, when I got letters from the people who had... Um, received his organs um so a lot of things so those were two specific things seeing him in the funeral home you know a few days afterwards um his funeral seeing the coffin for the first time so yes Mm. there was often when I was like really confronted with visible things that just kind of hit me over the head with the you know you can't you can't not see this uh you can't not read this you can't not engage with this yeah but then there was other times when I would just be like walking down the street and spot I suppose again it's another visual thing you know spot a cafe that I would might have gone and said oh look Billy let's try there and then realizing there's nobody to say that to so yeah sometimes it was it was like quite little things Mm. but it's when it's when it's when the reality cuts through I think when it cuts through the distraction and the dissociation and the just get on with it sort of attitude yeah one of the things that hit me in your book was when you said that you went to get the death certificate and that you you kind of learned his date of birth you knew it for so many things but now it wasn't going to be needed for stuff and it was going to be the date of the death that was the the thing that was most sort of known and remembered and that really hit me because I thought you don't think about that but you do learn your partner's date of birth and it's so useful in so many situations then suddenly be redundant I can see why things like that you'd you'd never think about would suddenly just come out of nowhere and and hit you yeah it's like just being sideswiped by just little things in life really um that remind you that he he isn't in life anymore to 
quote something that you've written as well to come back to some of, the, some of those darkest moments. Your words, what am I without him? I am nothing and I have nothing and I do not want to live. But then you later go on to sort of describe this movement from friends, some family members from all different walks of life gathering around you to be with you to put together a rota to help with different tasks and then just turning up to be with you had it taken some sort of this well this tragedy to make you realize that this network of support existed it did um i mean i always valued my friends hugely i always knew that i had lovely friends but i suppose it's the, when things are going well it's all easy to be you know uh, there for each other and um to not really get what you don't really know who's going to be there in the bad times until the bad times hit so I think when when I was in the hospital for all those days and just trying to kind of come to terms with the fact that you know he wasn't coming home two of the friends that had turned up initially on the first morning they'd, they'd done an incredible job of I kind of told them on that Monday night that what I'd just heard and they somehow turned up on the Tuesday morning I don't quite know how they they, they did it and they came with me to the hospital on, on that day. And I could, I knew, I mean, they didn't say they'd be very good at not showing this, but I knew they had kids and clients and families and that their whole lives had been disrupted to be there. And they kept sort of saying, well, who, who, who can we ring? Who can we get to be here with you? And my mind just went blank. I thought, well, there isn't anybody. You know, you two are my best friends and um, or I've got other friends. You know, my closest friends don't live in, in London. And um I've only got Bill. There's nobody else in my life. And it felt really desolate. And they, they sort of said, OK, well, come on, let's make let's make a plan and sort of got my phone out. And they were going through and I was like, oh, yeah, no, of course, there's that person, there's that person. And it sort of dawned on me that actually I did have quite a huge network. And then these these two friends rang the people that I kind of said, oh, I think this is my help. And before I knew it, people were like pouring in and I kind of realised, no, people do step up and people do love me and they do love Bill. And, you know, even the ones that maybe were more his friends than mine, they knew that they could honour him by looking after me. And that was really, really powerful. And I kind of I went from thinking, well, no, there was literally nobody. And if you two go home, then that that's it. I'm here on, on my own to thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got a whole army of people that are here for me. Um, and when you go through that with people, you you become friends in a very different way. Once your kind of friendships have been tested, I think um, you you do become family uh, because you've been through something really huge together. Yeah. With your therapist hat on, are there any things that you encourage or any ways that you encourage people to ask for help or to be able to verbalise if there's something they need? You know, you will get lots of people saying, let me know what I can do, but not actually just turning up on your doorstep to help. So how, yeah, how would you advise people to ask for help? Well, I think it does go against the grain for a lot of people to express need. And I just try and encourage people to understand that this is you know their darkest hour and that you know if you're saving favors up for a rainy day this is like a rainy day and all bets are off a little bit that that this is a chance for people to show what they're made of show what you mean to them and for you to kind of be able to accept that and in many ways it's a gift to be able to say to somebody yes you can do this for me because people are so keen to help so in a way you're offering them a gift by saying yes you can do this for me because they then think oh great I've done something I can feel like I'm I'm being useful so yes I, I think just talking to people about you know you might have to help them to help you you might have to just be really explicit even though this is hard for you just think, what do you need right now? And can you somehow verbalise that? And if you can't, can you verbalise the fact that you don't know what you need, but it'd just be quite nice to know they're in the next room or at the end of a phone or that they're prepared to answer in the middle of the night? Or So, you know, just to be able to say to them, I don't know what I need, but can you just please keep hovering or send me a text every day or, you know, something like that? Mm. Um but it, it is hard. I don't know if it's a, a British thing or, or what it is, but I, when you said in, in the book about you were thinking, should I call an ambulance, but you don't want to waste their time. It's a bit like that. You know, even when your husband dies, there's still that, is this the rainy day or could it be worse when I call on people to drop their lives from me? And we sort of put it off and we put it off and we're waiting for that awful thing. I don't know what that would even look like. And we don't sort of 
feel like we can do it now. And I think that's another tricky thing with things like childlessness, because it doesn't feel like a big thing, but you are sort of grieving. You do need support. And I think that's why you turn in on on your partner, because the two of you understand it's a very difficult thing to verbalise, which is kind of where the podcast came from, really. There's a lot of losses going on that people don't know how to, to talk about or even see as a as a grief. You've been through, sort of obviously, the childlessness kind of grief and the loss of your husband and the loss of your dad and grandparents. How do you judge when to ask for help? I think um, everything's worthy of, of asking for help and everything, every relationship can be deepened by showing a vulnerability, by saying, actually, this is really hard for me and um, this feels like a huge loss, whether it's a loss of something you haven't yet had, like a child or something that somebody else might see as trivial, like a grandparent or or something huge, like a husband or a child. I think just being able to say, I'm I'm not doing very well with this. I'm feeling very raw. Um, I think whatever the situation, whatever you're going through, being able to share that with somebody and again, offering them that gift of your 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 honesty and your vulnerability means that you then gain so much in terms of a, a deeper connection with that person and that is actually invaluable and that is probably the primary thing that I've learned through grief is that you don't really connect with people superficially anymore you have proper deep connections and that means you know you have a much richer life you have a richer internal life and you have a richer external life. So there are definitely benefits to be had, but it's a, <laughs> it's a very um, costly price to pay to get to those sort of realisations, I think. If, if I was to give you several slips of paper and just the time that we've been talking, some of those losses that you've mentioned, if you were to write on each slip of paper, sort of bill, another one, you know, your dad, you mentioned grandparents, um, the childlessness, uh, if you were to lay all those bits of paper down, how much do you think they would overlap? How much do they lean on each other or how how are they or are they separate? Yeah, well that's another thing actually is that um nothing's ever really separate. You know, everything that we are is accumulation of all the experiences we've had. So each loss will impact the next one. Um both in terms of you all, I think, feel it, you know, harder and harder each time because it's coming off the back of, of all those previous ones that are then being re, re-triggered to a certain extent and remembering them. Um, but also the, the gain from that is that you understand that you have the resilience, you have survived these other ones and you can survive this. But yes, I think they're absolutely becoming entwined um, and each one changes you in a different way and each one um, kind of adds up to the person that you are. Mm. Is is the the why question something you've ever struggled with? Kind of like, why me or why us or why Bill? Is there anything... Yeah, in my low moments, which still come, (laughs) of course. um, Yeah, it it feels, and particularly in the in the early days, I I very much felt that, and went to as a lot of people do, went to the self blame of you know clearly I was a terrible person in a previous life, or clearly I've done something really awful that I have to be punished for. I mean, that didn't, you know, I, I work quite hard to kind of move on from that because that helps nobody. Um, it's just, you know, grief's hard enough without piling on self-criticism and self-blame. But but I suppose in more recent years when, you know, obviously I'm more used to it and the grief has changed shape, <laughs> I when I get low, I, I kind of think, well, why why do I not? get to have kids why do I not get to have a husband why do I not get to have you know a big family of origin um where there's a lot of people to to kind of rely on so yeah like you say I try and pull myself back from that brink because you know why not me why not us um some people would say well you know you're really lucky to have known a really great love and to have had 14 years with your best friend and doing amazing things um and maybe you know you get 14 years of really lovely 
time together and maybe that's better than 28 years of a more mediocre relationship I don't know you can you can kind of put any spin on it that you want really and depending on my mood you know that spin will be be different um but I don't think there really are any whys um or not really you know answerable and um, I mean you can find purpose I can I can manufacture a why as in okay I, I, I I'm going to carry on his legacy I'm going to do good things I'm going to become a better person so you can make it into a, a a why in that sense but as to you know did it happen to punish me then I, I'm, I just don't think that that for me that is not helpful you mentioned a few words there that that struck a chord with me which tap into comparison um you know some some people would say you know how fortunate you were to have had a, a such a brilliant partner uh, and I really wrestle with that in that that Claire and I have so much yet there's still so much I feel like I've been unfairly treated uh, and so what's your relationship been like with comparison with others with children without children with partners without partners how what's your journey been like with with trying not to compare yeah and it's again depending on where I am you know emotionally myself sometimes that's easier than than other times um, I definitely have times normally you know <laughs> Easter or Christmas or birthdays or times when people you know, make a big thing of being with with other people. Um, and I feel like I can't intrude or I don't want to be part of somebody else's Christmas or or, or, or Easter. Then I, I definitely sink into a, it's not fair. They've got all these people. Or occasionally somebody will say something that, um, you know, will just land badly, like, um, oh, it's just so great to have like a day to myself. And I kind of think, yeah, I've had <laughs> four and a half years to myself and, um you know, you're very lucky to to experience that as a as a relief rather than a, a reality. So yeah, definitely there's times when I I, I, I feel very um, um, hard done by. I think other times I think, well, you know, I get to I get to please myself a bit like with the not having children compensation thing. I get to do exactly what I want when I want. I get to live a life, albeit not with Bill, but a, a, a life that, you know, he's kind of set me up to have. You know, I got to I got to experience a lot of really wonderful things that I wouldn't have done had had things been differently. And I struggled for a long time to find any positives in Bill dying without having had kids, without having experienced that, with me not having anything of him to... Um, continue on um and something somebody said to me really struck home which was that by not having kids you were able to pour all your love and time into bill and given that he didn't have long given that his life was very short that would have been diluted if we'd had kids of course like everybody um you know we, uh, each other would have become less of a priority because we would have been worried about the children and maybe that, you know, maybe that's fine if you've got several decades together. But given that he had such a short time on Earth, I mean, we really packed it in, in a way. And he knew, he knew he was adored and the most important thing to me. Um, and he wouldn't have had that. So, and that's, that for me, that's the the best way that I, I kind of help myself get over that, that feeling of unfairness that, you know, maybe there was, maybe there was a reason why we didn't have kids. Maybe it was so that he could have a really brilliant, albeit short life where he knew that he was absolute priority. Yeah. So like I say, it depends on my mood, really how I rationalize. <laughs> things. Yes, I get that <laughs> t- totally. What about with like other people? So who might, sort of live in fear of what you've been through because I know that with us with you know people just entering into infertility and things they would look at us and think well that's kind of our worst nightmare because they never had the children and we want the children so some people will be looking at uh, you know you having lost your partner and best friend and soulmate and being like well, well that's my worst nightmare I lose that what what would you say to people who are maybe just fearful of that or living in that space you don't know what you can survive if somebody had told me in advance uh what was going to happen i would have said well i'll never survive that and i won't want to survive it and that it it, it, it's it's horrific and i think the anticipation of something um 
is worse than the reality in many ways because with the reality yes it's awful but you do just keep putting one foot in front of the other you do find resources within yourself you do find the the sort of the, the gems from within the rubble um you do start to see the world slightly differently, to see yourself differently, to see your friends differently, um, to redefine what you're here for in a way. Um, I think you do feel more grateful. Um, again, not always. I'm talking about on a really good day. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would have been that person. I would have said, I will not survive this. And it, it it's unimaginable. And yet when it happens, you just put one foot in front of the other. And you do, you, you just, you just do. I can't really explain it other than it's one of those things that you have to go through to to realise that even when you experience your worst nightmare, there are gains to be found. There are positives to come out of it. We've had some individuals that we've spoken to that have had really strong senses or beliefs in being reunited with the person or the you know the thing that they've lost uh, and you touch on that within your writings as well about the sort of the spiritual sense how how important has it been for you to have a have a belief that you will be reunited again you'll see bill again yeah it's been really I- important although i'm not sure i would quite put it in those terms because it's not so much that i think i'll see him again it's more that i don't feel he's gone anywhere um his sort of material form has gone but I still feel him very much you know within me he's in my heart he's in my actions he's in his friends um he's in the air kind of thing so um I think I sort of believed that to be true before he died, but in a very don't really think about it much kind of nebulous couldn't really articulate it sort of a way but once he died and once I viscerally, literally could feel that presence, I, I don't have any doubts that he's still around. But that sounds, you know, I get that that sounds slightly nutty to, to people that haven't experienced that. And of course, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, that's wishful thinking and that just makes it easier, which, of course, may, may be true and is true. However, I also know that I I, I feel it in a way that I think people you know with strong religions feel a faith they don't you know you can use all the arguments in the world world if you have a faith and you feel it to be true then then it's it's true for you and in a way what does it matter if I feel it then it doesn't really matter what truth is so (laughs) it's my truth (laughs) (laughs) and another thing we've heard a lot of people talk about to help them through has been sort of different creativity and hobbies and things like that that have really helped them in their recovery I know that you've referred to creativity as a life raft is that um what sort of part has that played with your yoga and writing and other creative things yeah um it's, yes it's been huge it has been huge i mean particularly obviously the writing I, that was just my way of of trying to sort of make sense of the nonsensical and you know express the inexpressible and all all of those things by by writing and by turning it into um a book um that has helped me in, enormously that's definitely been a a life raft um things like movement absolutely uh where you're not engaging your 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 brain in the same way when it just comes from a more physical go with the go with your 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 physical body kind of sense that's been really lovely and really valuable and you know through dancing yoga swimming all sorts of things just being able to be very very present and not have to think that's been really really lovely I really appreciate other people's creativity. So passively experiencing art and music that other people have poured their selves into. I find that really comforting. Again, without words, you just know that you're experiencing what they're experiencing or that they're somehow showing you what you're experiencing. But even for me, actually, sort of something like gardening, you know, I'm not, you know, I potter around and do a bit of weeding and, you know, little bit of planting I'm not a a proper gardener in any shape or form but just being sort of down and dirty in the in the earth and seeing that rejuvenation again it's sort of quite symbolic that whole things dying new things growing beauty coming and going I get a lot of solace from that as well you were talking there uh, about how much 
enjoyment you get out of seeing others thrive and you know use the arts and the like to, to come to life which seems like a nice opportunity just to hear something about the bill cashmore award that you set up and launched in honor of bill so tell us tell us a bit about that the Bill Cashmore Award is something that has been really, really important to me in my kind of um, coming to terms with with Bill dying and wanting to put his death to, to good good use. It is a theatrical bursary that I set up in conjunction with the theatre called The Lyric in Hammersmith in London. And what it is, is I fundraise and we raise a, an amount of money each year and we take on a trainee or two trainees, two, one or two people who have an idea or a play that they want to put on. And we guarantee them that the following year, they will have four nights on the lyric stage to present a full length play that they have devised and written and in many cases acted in and directed themselves. And over the course of that year, to go from this idea to full length play we give them space and resources and mentoring and training and workshops and script editing advice and we give them um, access to um, the lyrics lighting um, people and their set design people and their marketing and they, they so they pretty much you know get to learn how to put on a play from the word go and it's aimed at people between the ages of 18 and 25 who live or work in West London and who haven't been to drama school, who haven't necessarily got the backing to be able to explore um, financially in, in that way. So it's giving them a chance that they wouldn't otherwise have had. It's giving them a voice to say the things that they want to say via a creative medium. And it's giving them a platform because when they do get to put their show on, we invite casting directors and producers and we try and help them organise a tour to smaller theatres or to a Edinburgh Festival. And it's been such a joy to me to feel like I am carrying Bill's name on, that I am carrying on his desire to motivate and encourage um, people to give a give an opening um, and a platform to somebody that wouldn't otherwise have it. And yeah, it's been a sort of win-win, really. It's been a really, really lovely thing to do. Do you go along and see them sometimes? Do you go and see them? Oh, yes. No, all, all the time. I mean, I stay in touch over the course of the year and I'm sort of like the... the the, the, the pastoral help, you know, they can come to me to chat and um, ask for what they need or say when things are going badly. And yeah, yeah, the, the four nights when the show is on is great. You know, I I mean, it's open, tickets are open to the public, but also it's a really good excuse to get all our friends and family along. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah. That must be really nice. We were say, only saying just last night, actually, we were watching a comedy on TV that was, um, by a very well-known person and was particularly bad. And uh, I said, I feel like they're getting lazy just finding new talent now. They need to they need to find some new people. Where are the, the next generation coming from? They all seem to be people we've known for 20 years. So I think that, that sort of thing sounds like something that will bring through some of those new talents and give them a bit of a shot, which is lovely. Yeah. How has all of this shaped how you see the future now? Has it completely changed how you, how you look forward compared to before losing Bill? It has. I used to be quite a planner. I kind of wanted to... To, you know have some plans in place and know where where things were going and nowadays I don't do that anymore I don't really plan anything <laughs> really I just kind of I, a I realized that um things change and all the things that you put in place can be swept out from under you I think we've all learned, learned that from COVID as as well um so a, there's no point in planning. And B, I just quite enjoy being able to go with the flow a little bit. I mean, I you know, have a, various ideas and things about what might I might like to, to do and how life might turn out. But the very short term, really. Um, I mean, it's also, I mean, that makes it all sound very positive. There's also a slightly less positive element, which is that it's just a bit frightening to look ahead too far when you're on your own. And especially in the early days, I think envisaging even just you know a couple of days further forward was too too much to cope with because it was like you know I've got to get through all these days without Bill I mean obviously like I say nowadays I'm more used to being on my own but I still sort of take some comfort in the kind of thinking well I'll just I'll just see what happens I'll go with the flow and I quite like that actually I quite I quite like being more um, in the moment and more kind of adaptable and flexible. 
I'm wondering with your therapist hat back on uh, how how much you hear now as a therapist you read uh, in terms of the theory the practice that you just completely just say no completely disagree with that that's not my experience that's nonsense so what's that sort of filter like now as a therapist as to what actually is genuinely really good practice and what is actually nah throw that out um well I think in all the grief theories that I have read about there's very little that is nonsense most things have nuggets of truth most things approach the truth but um until you experience it i think it's very hard to to get it just as a a theoretical concept so i think people that talk a lot about grief without really having experienced it um need to experience it a little bit to really fully get it um I think the very old sort of Freudian psychodynamic theory that um, you can kind of like shut a door and move on, that you do the grief work, you address all the all the pain and then it's over and then you can get on with your life. And if you don't do that, you can't get on with your life. That, I would say, is the only thing that I absolutely disagree with. And uh, most of the more modern grief theories um, think that that is not not the case, that, you know, most people do, as I was explaining before, they do take their loved one with them. They do kind of refer to them and sort of say, you know, what would Bill do? And um, and, th- and that doesn't stop you kind of moving on. I mean, I hate the words moving on because, you know, that means can mean so many different things. It doesn't stop you living a really full and happy and uh, fulfilling life. Um, you don't have to leave them behind in order in order for life to continue in a, in a nice way. So I suppose that is the one big thing that I dispute. In terms of working with my clients or listening to people that, that kind of want to kind of tell you how you should be doing it um the notion that there is only one way is not not correct everybody there are commonalities but everybody does it their way the notion that you can tell somebody um how you think they should be responding is is nonsense um so actually yeah now i think about it there's a few things (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, yeah i mean people come into therapy not so much nowadays but you know sometimes they'll come in and say oh I think there's something wrong with me my dad died three weeks ago and I'm still not over it and you know that certainly makes me sort of put head in hands to think oh this myth that you are ever going to be over it you will change and it will transform you but it's not like you're ever going to stop missing that person or being sad about that person but that doesn't mean it has to colour everything that you do yeah it's a discussion for another time another podcast but uh, you know historically or culturally even across the world there's there seems to be so much good practice elsewhere in the world to spend weeks or months in mourning uh, or going back through the ages to spend a lot longer to allow yourself and, and intentionally allow a longer time of grieving why in britain we seem to come on crack on a couple of days later and pull yourself together i'm, I'm not sure i think i heard correctly the very start of our chat that you mentioned um having been fairly familiar with therapy when you were a bit younger uh so we we still find that quite often with our own experience that you know, people are quite reluctant to seek therapy. Certainly, those of a certain age, maybe a bit older in this country, that they they think therapy is you know is not for them. Whereas in America, very common with it, everybody has a therapist. Uh, how would you maybe advise someone that's sitting on the fence as to I don't know whether I should bother with an expert or not? But you know, how would you advise them? You know, yes, do seek the help of a therapist. I think a therapist can bring so much more than you would imagine. I think people see therapy as being a sort of a way of solving and they're like, oh, well, I can see what I need to do. I just need to do it. Whereas actually therapy, I think, is a way of just spending some time with yourself or just a way of exploring all the things that are going on for you with somebody else who is different to a friend. I mean, obviously they've got training and they will you know they've they've got that expertise but just in the sense that they're not involved with you you know they didn't they don't know you they don't have a vested interest they didn't know the person that died they are not uncomfortable with you know if you want to spend 50 minutes just crying and not talking they will you know they're not going to rush you through that they're not going to tell you you're doing it wrong you don't have to worry about boring them or overwhelming them. Um, they can hold the space. Um, so you can just be you. And that can mean 
exploring to a really deep level or it can just be to sit and cry and be okay or to sit and shout whatever you feel you need to do sometimes people like the idea but they say that cost would be an issue are there options for people who maybe can't afford to go private? Yeah, with these I mean, things? cost is a huge issue, and it's um, it's really tragic that that should be the case. I mean, you can get um, short term therapy on the NHS, but at the moment, I mean, COVID has just it was it was pretty bad before, and it's just made it worse. But the waiting lists are humongous. There are therapists who will. Um, have um, some low cost clients in amongst their their client base you know for every five full paying clients they might maybe offer one low cost place there are a lot of training organizations that run low cost clinics and charities that run low cost clinics again waiting lists can be high i wouldn't be put off by the fact that you might be seeing somebody who's training because they're not you know they will have trained for at least two or three years before they're kind of let loose on you and often i I actually think somebody in training is maybe even a better therapist than someone that may be doing it for years and got a bit kind of um jaded or or lazy somebody who's in the midst of their training and who has to go and sort of report back so yes there are charities i mean cruise bereavement care they offer free i think or maybe low cost i'm not entirely sure but yes charities uh, therapy training organizations the nhs but yeah it is it is hard our final question has arrived which is what is your herman yeah okay so (laughs) I think my Herman is um, trying to be more Bill in the sense that um, Bill always wanted to bring the best out of other people. He always wanted to encourage them, motivate them, praise them and push them to being, you know, as good as they could be. This is partly why the Bill Cashmore Award came about, because it was so much in the ethos of what he wanted to do. So I think my Herman is to see the goodness in people and really help kind of try and push them to to be the best they can be and one of the things that Bill always used to say to me it was one of his little things was um you know um oh that's the best thing you've ever done and that might be something huge like training as a psychotherapist or it might be you know finding the ketchup in the fridge that he swore blind wasn't there um but you know several times a day he'd say oh that's the best thing you've ever done um so it was a bit of a mantra and it was a joke obviously but he also meant it you know he he would genuinely think it's the best thing you've ever done but he was constantly praising people so i think my herman is to try and be more bill to praise encourage um motivate and, and push people to 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 be the best they can How much better would the world be if we were all able to encourage, praise and motivate others without selfish motives? Sasha, thank you so much for your time, your honesty and your willingness to help others. I think that might be the best thing you've ever done. After marrying Bill. To find out more about Sasha and her books, you can visit her website, sashabates.co.uk or follow at sashbates on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We'll put links to those and details of her books in the show notes. And for more about us, you can visit thesilentwhy.com or find us on social media at the Silent Why Pod. And for those bills out there who say lovely, encouraging things about us on social media, thank you. And why not copy and paste that over to review the podcast if you haven't already? And if you're not sure how, just drop us an email and we'll help you out. The Silent Why at gmail.com We're finishing this episode with a passage I chose from the end of Sasha's book, Languages of Loss. And since I love to hear an author express their own words, I asked Sasha to read it for us. I feel I finally know how to end this book. I think back to the eulogy I gave at his funeral. I am heartbroken, but I am not broken. And that I am able to say that is entirely due to Bill. I am stronger now than when he met me all those years ago. And that is because I have had 14 years of being loved unconditionally by a man with the biggest heart I know. Bill, marrying you is the best thing I have ever done. As Bill's familiar refrain of encouragement rings in my ears, I know that the coming year will bring waves of pain when I think of the happiness I have lost. But I also know that like the ebb and flow of the water beneath me, it will bring waves of new happiness I am yet to discover too. And Bill will be alongside me for both. He still represents my safe ship of stability, 
and would be sailing with me onto the new adventures and uncharted seas ahead. Thank you.